As we know, it's been a difficult time for investors and traders alike over the last four or five months, six months or so. And uh, there are a lot of questions about where we go in the future as we approach the end of 2022 into 2023. Will that page turning event improve things in terms of the outlook? There was a lot bubbling under the covers in terms of some of the fundamentals to watch out for. But now we're taking a look at what all this means for AIM stocks and the opportunities that seem to be presenting themselves. Chris Boxall is from Fundamental Asset Management, a portfolio uh, management company in the AIM sector. And Chris joins us now with his thoughts on where things are going. Chris, welcome. When we uh, when we put this interview together, uh, we were talking about the opportunities for bottom fishing. I know that we may not actually be at the bottom yet. How are you feeling as an AIM specialist? Well, I'm, I'm fairly fe- feeling fairly beaten up, but uh, um, I've seen this too many times now. And on every occasion, you know, things look pretty miserable. And it's often when it looks the most miserable that it's time to, to have a really close look at things. And that valuations have come back massively, as, as I think we're going to cover. AIM itself has had a, a really torrid year, ha- having previously having a, had a very, very good run over the, the pandemic when it materially outperformed uh, the, the UK main market. But we've had a pretty awful year. Valuations have come back in a lot of places valuations of really good companies that's the important point here these are good businesses that are profitable cash generative and look pretty strong but i think one of the slides we're going to look at now shows the the extent of the the sell-off for aim yeah let's let's examine these numbers because they're now up on the screen and we've got these massive uh, returns negative returns uh, in all quarters here just quickly run through i mean aim we've spoken about this before haven't we aim stocks quite often um, the, the pendulum swings to extremes, doesn't it? If the markets are going up, AIM stocks seem to outperform, and on the way down, they're the ones that seem to get beaten up most. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it becomes a liquidity issue. Um, the, bit, the, the real key point is now, and I've had this issue with some clients, the companies aren't doing badly. The companies are actually doing quite well, many of, many of the companies that you know in this index. However, their share prices don't re- reflect the reality what comes in a small cap sell-off is the liquidity, the illiquidity issue, and shares fall very, very quickly, and there's nothing stopping them. It's also almost this vicious circle because you've got four sellers uh, of, um, of open-ended funds and then with very little liquidity, no buyers, and they've got to take whatever price there is. So you, so you have this thing tumbling ever, you know, downwards. Um, but the, the actual returns of the businesses themselves have been pretty good. Just talk to us a little bit about um, the the makeup of AIM. Something else, in terms of your research you, you sent through to me, uh, talking about the numbers of companies on AIM at the moment, is, is this a typical sort of churn you would see at any time of the year or at any time of whatever period? Or is it most notable now for any particular reason? Well, AIM, AIM had a pretty good year in 2021 in terms of new issues. There are a lot of new companies coming on. I think we, we looked at there were there are about 80 of new, new issues coming on. So unfortunately, this year, there have been very few um, new issues. And that's been a real issue. It'll be a very long, low period in terms of new companies coming on the market. Um, and AIM needs uh, an influx of new companies and good companies. And the sort of businesses that came on in 2021, many of them had very unproven business models, which turned out. A lot of them from the online retail space. You know, that's typical of uh, the corporate finance brigade. They see an opportunity and offloaded a load of somewhat questionable businesses onto the market, uh, nearly all of which are now, well, all of them are, are sitting well below their IPO, IPO price. So that's been pretty drastic. AIM itself, you've seen it contract from 20 plus um, companies with billion pound value, valuations to only 14. So you've seen this contraction at the top. There are almost double the number of billion pound plus companies in terms of market capitalization. So there has been a big swing and a big swing in the value from a peak of circa 140 billion, the whole market, down to sub, you know, around 90 odd billion. So you can see there, there has been this big move and a big move in a lot of AIM's larger companies as well. And specs, sector specific in this retail direct to consumer space, a big movement down in value. So where have the worst performers been then? Well, the, the really awful sector has been this retail and specifically online retail and direct to consumer. Um, and it's been a terrible place to be. 
you had a load of new issues in this space in 2021, and nearly many of them were loss making. Uh, and it's subsequently discovered that they haven't got terribly robust business models. This this whole online retail space needs a total rethink, in my opinion, because they're having to spend huge sums of money on marketing and a low low gross margin, well, many of them low gross margin businesses to retain what are short life customers. I mean, in other in other walks of life, if you spend a lot to get a customer, typically you're going to keep that customer over a longer period of time. Well, these, you know, these groups are spending vast amounts to keep a customer that's going to swan off next month somewhere else. I mean, it, it just doesn't work. If, if anything, there's, there's hope for the, for the high street again, I think, at these rates, especially with falling, falling rents. It's quite, it's quite interesting how things have swung around very, very quickly. So online retail has been a complete disaster. And you, you've got, I, I counted, I think, seven plus companies of the nine new issues. Uh, I think have fallen 90% or more, or it, it might you know, it might be six. Now, some of them might have perked up a little bit over recent recent days. But, I mean, that's horrendous. I mean, 90% fall in value from the IPO price. And at IPO, with some of them, you saw the, the huge selling on IPO. I think one IPO saw about 100 million exits, uh, taking you know, money off the table on the valuation. And so you've got to have a lot of unhappy shareholders there it's a classic case that the, the lawyers have won the corporate brokers have won the founders have won because they've exited with large millions and millions in the pockets um, but the poor old stock market investors are, uh, are carrying stat, you know significant losses on it and, and, and that's got to change really because there'll be no confidence in the ipo space if that sort of scenario continues those watching this interview want me to ask the question about where we're seeing resilience is there any pockets of of, of profitability at the moment in terms of share activity or, or the least worst performance perhaps maybe ought to be the question. Yeah, you are getting, you know, there are good spaces. Um, AIM software groups look have come down a lot, but some of them have been subject to takeover approaches. Typically these are businesses with terrific recurring revenue, great cash flow, reliability of earnings. So they're good. Ironically, probably the oldest type of business, one of the oldest type of businesses in the world of which there are two on AIM, the pawnbroking world, they've got other services in them, but poor broking is a pawnbroking is a core activity. They've been terrific. They've done, done very, very well. Their share prices have held up well because clearly the withdrawal of government support. Now the pawnbrokers are suddenly back in the game again. So they, that's been a strong area as well. FX, people, FX trading has been quite, quite good. So that, that you know, there have been pockets of, of positives and energy, anything really energy related has, has been quite interesting. Um, so yeah, there, there there are positives, but will those positives go on to to thrive and to move much much higher? We shall see. And is this the time to stick with your winners of twenty one, or or to run with some of the, the the really? I have a look at some of the really unloved, which have seen their valuations you know cut in half. Yeah, I want to take a look in some more detail at some of those unloved in just a minute. I want to pick up on the point you mentioned about lack of liquidity. How does this play out across the end market? This this is really the the big issue um, because you have. In, in the smaller space, um, bid offer spreads widen. You've got big institutional sellers and very few buyers affecting the retail space. So this, this lack of liquidity effectively is pushing the prices down even further. The, the really awful uh, issue in the structuring of smaller companies are open-ended funds, in my opinion. Open-ended funds in the small cap space are a complete disaster zone. Um, when these are open-ended you know, investments rather than closed-ended, i.e. trusts. Trusts have fixed money uh, and can control things far better. You know, they're not having to manage redemptions, whereas open-ended funds, particularly those in small microcaps, have, often have managing redemptions just at the very points that they should be assessing things to buy. So they're, they're forced sellers when they should be buyers, and then they become forced buyers when they should be sellers because they've got more and more money. You know, when times are good, people are chucking more and more money at them. They have to forced to invest that money. And um, so they're buying and pushing things ever upwards. And this, this, is, this becomes the crazy situation. I mean, it's something I feel that the FCA needs to, to grapple with. I think this is actually an advantage for the retail investors. Retail investors buying in smaller amounts of money have a real advantage here. They can be more nimble. They're not trading in hundreds and in thousands and millions of pounds of trades. 
uh, and that they, they do have a di distinct advantage in, in the small cap arena. They can get in and they can get out as well. And of course, the other area you've already alluded to is the fact that AIM is, is being, people are turning away from listing at the moment. I think that's, that's, the, that's the message, isn't it? And the fact that we're not getting the new issues coming through. As you said earlier as well, AIM relies on this sort of, this, this churn, this, this, this bringing on new names and so forth. How is 2022 panning out? Well, it looks a bit of disaster at the moment. I mean, the new issuance activity in AIM for 2022 is going to, could be the worst on record. It, as I say, in context, 21 was a very good year. I was 80 odd plus new issues. 2022, I think we've had about 16. And I think the worst previous, that was 20, uh, 23. So unless it picks up in the last quarter, and currently that looks unlikely, it's going to be a pretty dire year for new issues. And looking back again, the sort of new issues that came on um, in 21, a lot of them with these online retail plays or direct-to-consumer plays, which have been terrible. Uh, and the other, the other fact is AIM is not now a market for new untested businesses. It's very hard to grow if you're a speculative, loss-making, earlier stage business on public markets. Investors just don't have the, the appetite or patience for it. You know, they, you, these, these businesses need to be able to grow and, and to in, invest and conceivably maybe loss making for several years. Well, AIM, a public market is, is really not a great place for that. So I think you're, you're looking at the new issues that come to AIM probably that needs to be more mature and, and proven, at least their business model needs, needs to be more proven. Then they'll get a far better hearing and, uh, and it will be reflected in a much improved share price performance. Mm. Let, me, let me just return, if I can, to a graphic I know that we've already shown, but I want to go into more detail of this. A sector you say we ought to be cautious of, you re reference the retailing uh, sector. But I want to talk into some more detail and dig a little bit deeper into this, because um, this direct consumer thing, the, the retail area, the area that you say we should be cautious about, what, what's going on here particularly? Well, I've alluded to the, the, the poor performance of online retail and you, you, people, it's a sector that people, it, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of common sense sector, I would call it. It's where everybody can have an opinion and it's very visible because everybody has exposure to it. It's direct to consumer and it's retail. So they can relate to it very, very easy. So people fall in and out of love with this kind of sector very quickly. And, and look, in fairness, it, it has been the source of AIM's greatest success, a huge success, which was ASOS. I mean, ASOS listed, a, I don't know what it was, a £10 million business originally and ended up as a, a £1.3 billion business. So it's had this single success story. Um, you know, subsequently, ASOS has fallen off a lot. And it, it's had other success stories because everybody sees it. You know, they can relate to it very, very easily. Boohoo was another one. But it's, it's a real maybe for, for your viewers, people watching this, it's a, tr it's, a, it's a real trader's market, a, small, a trader's market where you need to be nimble and be prepared to get in and out. Uh, good money can be made. As a long-term buy and hold investor, it's a very tough sector for us to be in, and it's why we, we generally avoid it if we can. Um, but it's, it's, it's had, a, I think, only, I think there are only two out of the 26 that the companies on it whose share prices now or two or three, two or three out of 26, the share price is above their IPO price. And bear in mind that some of these IPO prices go back a few years. This isn't just 2021, this is going back many years. And I think the median return we worked out, the median return it, in its in existence is 30%. Now, if you strip out um, you know, some of the big winners there, notably Boohoo's share price soared at one point from, from IPO, which come back a lot, I think there was another one, Port Myron. I mean, there are effects to be without those, it will be the median return will be heavily negative. Um, but there, you know, there have been huge swings in that sector. If you're prepared to be nimble, be an active trader, small, a, a small player, retail player, I think you could have done well there. But it's not a sector for the long term buy and hold. We like to buy businesses as a firm that you know, are 100 million, 200, 300. You can go up and have, address huge global markets potentially. Or, and, or huge UK markets and get very, very big. It seems to be that a real glass ceiling for, for, for retail and on, well, now more online retail in, in, in the UK in particular, where it, they're, they're struggling to move forward, at least in a, 
in a commercial and viable and credible manner. As, as, a, as a long-term investor in this space and as an accountant, I know that you are able to dig into areas perhaps maybe other people are not able <laughs> to analyze long the same past. way. Well, well none, nonetheless, but you, you bring the, your history through into what you're doing today. So I'm just trying to trying to work out a way in which we can uh, look at this um, for those that don't have the sort of experience. What Clarify a good company. I mean, we've spoken about this before in previous interviews about how you assess quality. What fundamentals do you insist upon for companies that you want to tick off on a box tick sheet thing to say, yes, I like this company because of ABC? Well, our, our mandate focuses on profitable businesses for a start. So in, in terms of our main mandate, we only look at companies that are, uh, have got a demonstrable period of profitability. And when we say profitability, positive cash generation. And um, we also like one of our key boxes for us for a, a large element of our book of founders or man management having significant equity stakes where we really like them having a lot of skin in the game and, and importantly, real skin in the game. So they've invested their own cash at a certain point and will be following up on that. We dislike the opposite of those. Um, we like to get we, we get we as a firm have got fed up with fairy tale EBITDA reporting. This wonderful term EBITDA that everybody throws out is a complete nightmare. Um, earnings as well from many AIM companies are, are just works of fiction. They're just something created. They're, 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 I mean, they're just everything's adjusted to, to meet this number. So you as, an, as, a, as somebody looking at it, you've got to get through that and look at the cash flow of the business and what the free cash flow ideally is. We don't mind companies investing their cash flow, um, but you've got to look at free cash flow. We don't like manic acquirers. We think, uh, you, you know, what we looked, we did a study at some of the companies we hold. As businesses, they were much better real businesses when they were small. They weren't good listed companies because they were too small. But when they first came onto the market, their actual businesses were far better. Margins were better. Returns on equity were great. Uh, cash flow was great. Suddenly they start acquiring. They get bigger, but they become far worse businesses. It's a classic case of an acquisition. Um, so they get bigger, but they're not very good. Well, they, they're, not, they're not better. They're actually far worse. And we've seen recently integrations. If you keep acquiring people businesses, it's very hard to integrate cultures. We've seen that with one. One of the share prices fallen about 70% recently. Not in one of our stocks, but one we've looked at. But they, have, you know, they need to integrate. So we don't like manic acquirers. We like organic growth, self-generated self growth. Yeah. Let me, let me just quickly run through some of the stocks you want to talk about, because um, we've spoken about some of these before. CVS Group is one of them. We've got a share price chart here yeah. for CVS Group. Um, is, this, is this on your, your list of wanting to own or you avoid? Absolutely. It? What, Absolutely. CVS, it doesn't take the founder ownership box um, because it's, it's very much you know, the, it's outside management. It's long past founders. It was VC backed really many, many years ago. It's a terrific cash generator. Again, ignore earnings there. It, it does acquire a lot, but typically out of its own internal it generates cash flow or it's taken away. So it has acquired, but it's big. Um, it addresses a disability services group addressing a booming pet population, which isn't going to kick in for some time because um, aging, you know, it's, you typically you have this big rush of new pets over lockdown. Well, typically it addresses more pets when they get older. It's got lots of other bolt-on bits to its core veterinary services business, um, you know, pet crematoria, diagnostic centers. It's got a pharmaceutical side. Um, but new management revolutionized that about three years ago. They really took a grip of the organic growth and, and, and it's far, it, look, it looks far more encouraging. But we like it a lot at current levels. Again, focus um, on the free it, cash flow, ignore the earnings. Is it an income stock or is it something you'd expect to see growth on? If we go back to the chart, it's currently trading at 1757. No, the, highs, the highs that we saw back in September 2021 were at 2753. Are you expecting a lift in share price or are you happy with dividend payments? What's the situation? Absolutely. I see this. I see now this business has got a stable position, cash coming through. It's, it's sort of had a small foray into Europe, which is it's toe dipping a bit. I can see it's still got a growth in the UK, but not not you know not to the same. So it's, it's going to have a lot of organic growth, as I say, from the growth in the pet population uh, and the yeah. increasing expenditure on pets that we're we're placing. But there's a European bit in there that, if it gets right, could be really interesting. Yeah, 
Um, we're hearing a lot more about infrastructure spending. Of course, this is part of the economic cycle we're in, where governments now want to talk about building hospitals, rail networks, and schools, so forth, roads, and whatever. Um, uh, but I noticed that you've got Breeden Group in your list of stocks to watch. Again, is this one of those that you yeah. like, or um, where is it going? Clearly, if you look at the I share do. price, I like chart. its space. It's funny. It's funny. This brings me back to I gave a talk many years ago, and I and I mentioned Breed as an example of a business with an amazing protective moat. It's got all its own quarries and you know quarries and asphalt plants. Very hard to get planning permission for quarries, and it's the sort of material that needs to be close to site. You can't start shipping you know great heavy stones from over the water or from wherever Europe. This, this, these, these products have to be UK based and close to where the 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 construction's going on. Typically, you don't want to have to carry them on a, a lorry for too too far. Um, so Breeden has this amazing protective moat. It was a quite a big business. It was always traded at a, a sort of premium valuation. And look at it, the share price has you know, just been absolutely slammed because of this fear of a, a pullback in maybe construction activity, maybe house building activity. But house building is a small you know, the minor part of this, of this exposure. It's mainly to public works and big infrastructure projects. So we think Breeden's pretty well placed. And then, you know, debt, debt's going to be coming down. Um, cash flow's awesome when, it, when it's, you know, it's got the plants up and running. It has to make regular investment, but cash flow is pretty, pretty good. Um, I think what may have sort of irked holders or worried people is that they're making sort of soundings to go into the United States. And that's often been the, you know, the death knell of UK businesses. Um, but in the meantime, they've got an awful lot of work in the UK and in Ireland as well. So, so we like that, especially at these levels. I mean, everybody's predicting that the construction set's just going to fall off a cliff. Well, now is the time probably to be looking at. I mean, look at the price. It's already already tumbled. So uh, uh, it's, it's already gone quite, quite far as it is. Yeah. Um, Gamma Communications is also on your list of stocks to watch. What's the story there? It's a comms company, um, Unified Communications, according to the release. Yeah, it's a unified comms. I mean, we're, hopefully the connection's all right because I'm speaking to you via the, one of their one of their systems. <laughs> um, um, it's it's a tip, it's a it's a business that generates lots of recur reliable recurring revenue, terrific cash flow. It probably is probably not that well liked by its brokers because it ne it's never had to come back to the stock market to raise more money. It's all all its growth has been generated from internally generated cash flow, uh, which is commendable. Again, so it, it won't be on, it won't, nobody will want to cover it because it doesn't reward the, the financial community very much, but we, 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 we like it a lot. So it's reliable, we're very sticky customers. You know, you want, if your IT is reasonably good, your communications are good and they're all integrated. Now everybody's working at home and home office. So everything needs to be sort of integrated and, you know, it supports ro remote working. Um, you, you won't leave as long as it's good and they've got some pretty big clients in the public and the private sector. Growing strongly in Europe, um, UK market a bit more mature, but big growth opportunities in Spain and Germany. Uh, and, and we like it, that sticky business, strong cash position as well. It's got about 75 million of cash. So everything it buys, it buys from, it, from its own balance sheet. Uh, and as a result, return, return on equity and capital is pretty good as well. But, you know, we, we like this one a lot in, in the current, especially given the way the shares have sold off. Just a couple more, very quickly run through a couple more if we can. Inspects is another one I think is on your list. Yeah, this is slightly lower down the scale. Its valuation has been slashed. Um, it's about 130 odd million market cap now, a bit, maybe a bit more than that. It's a business that makes uh, lenses and, and spectacle frames. It's, 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 it's one that I'm referring, you know, as you pointed out, it's a sort of company that's evolving too fast almost in public markets for, for the you know, which isn't well, well, that isn't well liked, you know, it's, it's having, expending more on its own manufacturing plants. So there's going to be this earnings lag, um, but it's addressing a huge market. I mean, more, every, more and more of the world's having to wear glasses, corrective, you know, corrective glasses. Um, it's, it's the only player of its kind. I and mean, there are a few listed companies. I think that there is a giant in the sector, a French listed business, another Italian one, but that's about it. So there are a few companies in this vast global sector, and we think Inspects is an interesting position. It's big founder ownership still. Founders bought a load more shares a few months ago, albeit they took a lot off the table on IPO. It's going to do 220 million plus revenue this year on now market cap at 150. We think it should be making decent, you know, decent margins on that. 
give what you know in, a, in 18 months time but again it's, it's doing a lot in the public eye and stock markets don't like they like consistency of earnings and probably a, li- a little bit uh, underappreciated at the moment but we think in, an interesting point let me look at the weather as i say where the price is now yeah um one other stock is worth mentioning according to your list is is fever tree uh, what's the reason behind picking up on this one well, I thought it was worth, we hold it and we, we didn't buy it at its peak and we didn't buy it anywhere near its low. We've taken a thumping on it lately and it's the most heavily shorted. I mean, the, sorry, the second most heavily shorted AIM stock. It's about 6% short interest. Um, I think it's doing very, very well, uh, although the share price doesn't. But it's heavily shorted worried. presumably for a reason. Well, everybody it's, thinks it's consumers hev- spend. That we're not going to be wanting to fork out very much on them. Um, on uh, expensive mixers uh, to go with our right. expensive uh, you know, spirits. <laughs> and the UK growth was stunning. And everybody's saying, oh, the UK is going to be a struggle. Well, this business is not about the UK. It is now all about overseas growth. And the US in particular, it's spending a lot of money in the US. It's, it's partnered with a new bottling company out there. And I think you have to see, look at its board. It's got some real heavy hitters on its board. And they've just forked out two of the non-executive directors just forked out £700,000 on shares. Uh, and these are people with great knowledge of the US market. Um, valuation looks, still looks punchy, but it, you know, this is AIM's one truly great global, global brand company and a company in terms of AIM that could be multiple times its existing size and still be small. So going back to what we like, big is beautiful on AIM, small is suspect. This is a big company circa just under a billion valuation but it could be still three four it could be a 20 billion value and actually not that big in its sector in you know in the grand scheme of um of the beverages sector um so it has an opportunity loads of innovation loads of developments great marketing great brand which is worth keep, keeping an eye on it might be a little bit more challenging for the next few weeks and it you know it won't be you know it might be exposed to some consumer weakness but it's a, it's a heck of a business in there i think okay chris we'll have to leave it there but thanks indeed uh, for joining us that's uh, chris boxel from fundamental asset management and if you want to contact chris you can do that through his uh, his website just one other aspect i wanted to pick up on very briefly chris mentioned uh, directors buying or indeed selling stocks in some cases of their own companies it's worth lo- uh, looking at uh, some of the directors dealings uh, when looking at this because as chris has mentioned it's always an insight into how the board are feeling about stocks in their own companies that's it for this look at AIM stocks on this part of the cycle, which is showing some really hefty weakness in many of the areas of the markets. For more videos from us here at IGTV, join us on Twitter at IGCom, Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.